Excellencies, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to see so many of you here at the GCSP this, this afternoon. Welcome back. I wish we would be gathering today for uh, an, a topic that isn't as heavy as the one that we will be discussing, but it is important. The crisis in Sahel is persistent and growing, and it is becoming more desperate every day. Today marks the seventh event of our new GCSP Geneva Security Debates. We hope that these Geneva security debates will inform international practitioners and policymakers worldwide with new insights and new ideas. In the long run, we hope these debates will help us to shape a better and safer global future. This is a hybrid event. We, will have about, we have about 50 people here in the room today and about 90 online. Today, we are very fortunate to have a partner in launching our seventh Geneva Security Debate, the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund, GSERF, an organization that was spawned here at the GCSP. GSERF's executive director was the former deputy director at the GCSP. Without their collaboration, we would not be fortunate enough to have this very eminent panel uh, today. Why are we talking today about a new caliphate? And why are we focusing on Africa? I hope to describe that in a moment. So please allow me to make some introductory remarks, and then I will pass the floor to our moderator today, Dr. Leela Shumiki Logan, who will introduce our excellent panelists. Last month, Burkina Faso suffered from a coup d'etat it is the seventh coup d'etat that has occurred in the region in the last 26 months. These uphe upheavals cement this African region as the most pronounced center of a new global crisis. There are two types of crises going on in this region. One is a humanitarian crisis, which is helping to feed a dangerous security crisis. Poor and authoritarian governance is breeding extremism and transnational criminality, igniting violence and undermining efforts of good go governance. It is also undermining democracy. In the Sahel, the security situation continues to deteriorate with indiscriminate terrorist violence, means, meaning that thousands of innocent civilians are suffering daily and millions of others are forced to leave their homes. Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State are on the rise in Africa. Following last year's military power grabs in Chad, Mali, Guinea, and the Sudan, the new crisis is highlighting the widening risks to security for over 135 million people who are living in the Sahel region. Conflict in the region has been largely driven by the jihadist insurgency centered in the states of Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, but which is now spreading across the region. Let me just give you some figures to highlight the two crises, the humanitarian crisis and the security crisis. OCHA has produced an excellent report on the humanitarian needs of the Sahelian states. It has highlighted that over 30 million people will require assistance in 2022, and only 20 million are targeted. This leaves about 9 million people without aid. This is the Sahelian region, the region that we will be talking about today. It consists of land between uh, the, the Atlantic Ocean and the Red Sea, and it covers a mass of approximately 3 million square kilometers. Within the region, there are five of the most hungry countries in the world, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, the Sudan. It is one of the most desperately poor regions of the world as well. OCHA has highlighted the enormous crisis of the Sahelian states, and it has given us some figures. 
Thank you. So here you see the OCHA slide uh, that has uh, from the humanitarian report that I have mentioned earlier. Um, as you can see, $3.8 billion will be needed to deal with the Sahel crisis at this point. Uh, there are 6.3 million people who are displaced and 14.4 million people who are food insecure. Another Another chart uh, from, from this OCHA report shows also that, that there's growing insecurity in, in millions of people having been displaced. Uh, this means that it not only uproots lives, but it also uproots livelihoods. Um, and this has been a 40% increase from 2021, where people are displaced. 50% of these uprooted are women and children. The most vulnerable people are the most ones who are hit the hardest. This has also created an, a, a deep problem in education. High levels of stress have caused children to underperform in school, and 91% of children are feeling uh, strong emotions and uh, feel no longer safe. And this anxiety uh, it has an important impact on school performance. Another problem is that 7,878 schools have been closed um, in the Sahel due to the violence there. This, is a, this uh, kids not being in school is a result of a generation of children who will fall behind. And um, in, uh, in our next slide, one of the most important uh, new aspects also is that 8,000 young people are, are, are vulnerable to being recruited by these extremist groups. As you can see from this map, uh, in the lower uh, left hand, uh, in, in between January and December 2015, the amount of violence that occurred in the region comparatively to what is happening between January and December in 2021. There is an increasing uh, situation that has gotten very uh, critical. And you can see the red dots include battles, explosions, and violence against civilians. So the security situation trend is dramatically rising in the Sahelian states. The Islamic State first so-called caliphate took root in Iraq and Syria amid the chaos of the latter's civil war. Today, the Islamic State is currently active in more than 20 African countries, and the continent may represent the future of the caliphate. In mid-August, the last French troops left Mali for neighboring Niger, ending a nine-year mission in the, in the sprawling West African nation of 21 million people. The French were part of an ambitious Paris-led effort to fight back an Islamist militant threat that was spreading across the Sahel. But the mission ended incomplete, despite billions of euros spent and thousands of Malian lives as well as French soldiers' lives lost, leaving in its wake a deteriorating security strategy. Militants from factions linked to both Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State have entrenched themselves in a widening battlefield across the African continent. The French departure from Mali was triggered when the military junta seized power in August 2020 and carried out a coup within a coup part of an epidemic of coup d'etats in the region. France remains engaged in the wider Sahel region, and Niger will become the new hub for French troops. However, in Mali, attacks by Islamist insurgents have spiked in recent weeks as the French completed their exit. The cancer has spread through Mali. In Mali, nearly 2,700 people were killed in conflict in the first six months of this year, almost 40% more than in all of 2021. In Niger, deaths in conflict have fallen slightly, but will probably exceed 1,000 in 2022. In Burkina Faso, in the first half of the year, about 2,100 people have been killed. Further afield, the Islamic State's affiliated militants are waging attacks across a swath of Central and East African states, from northern Mozambique to Uganda, Uganda to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. 
In Somalia, al-Shabaab's an insurgent faction originally linked to Al-Qaeda remains a powerful force and a threat with such a menace that it prompted President Biden to redeploy US forces to the country. There needs to be a policy reset. This is why we are here today to help build greater awareness in international policymakers who need to recognize that the Sahel is a new core of the world's biggest security crisis. A continuous swath of countries destabilized, not by some inexplicable prediction to violence, but by a visible root cause, toxic governance. Generations of corrupt authoritarian rule by elites rather than by laws has prevented and undermined democracies there and investments as well, and the ful fulfillment of human security needs. These failures of governance have bred violent extremism, communal conflicts, and military coups. International responses to the Sahel crisis, led largely by France and the United States and the United Nations, have focused primarily on armed counterterrorism, such an approach that has led to wider violence human displacement and destabilization. We need a new reset and many international policymakers now understand that stabilization in the Sahel means handling leadership and accountability to credible institutions in the region. First of all, to the 15 nation economic community of West African states, ECOWAS, and on uh, as well as other uh, neighboring states. A more effective approach will be led by credible, accountable institutions rooted in the region. We need a whole of society and whole of government approach that begins with meeting the basic needs of people and communities in these violent, stricken states. Based on these principles, we are now, uh, we are going to have a panel who will give us some ideas that will feed into a report that we will send to the US Africa Leaders Summit in Washington, from the, which will be held from the 13th to the 15th of December. I would like now to pass the floor uh, to Dr. Leela Shumiki Logan, who is the Deputy Executive Director and Head of Portfolio Management at GSERV and former Project Coordination Specialist in Somalia, where she developed and designed evidence-based strategies in the areas of community security, political participation of women and youth, and restorative justice. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Shumiki Logan for chairing this next event and I wish you all a very good debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, and thank you to, to GCSB and my GSERF colleagues who have uh, made this uh, debate possible. But first and foremost, thank you to the real experts on the panel here and also in the audience. They are colleagues from the countries where GSERF works. And uh, I think you have the bio of everyone on the, on the seat, so I suggest that we get in to the discussion immediately. And let me turn to, to my colleague Yusuf from Burkina Faso uh, and to hear from him that what is happening in Burkina Faso after the second coup. You have recently returned from Dori, which is a city that is pretty much isolated and cut off from Vagadougou. We know that over 40,000 schools are closed in Burkina Faso. Nearly a million children are out of it. You have been there, you have seen it. What did you see? How does it affect uh, radicalizations, people's decision on joining different armed groups, including violent extremist groups. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lida. As you say, Dori is uh, the biggest city, actually, in the three border region, that's uh, bordering with Niger and uh, Mali. And the city is actually under the threat of uh, ISIS, ISIS in the, in the Sahel. And, uh, you know, uh, 46 kilometers from Dori, there was a massive uh, mass killing, 
in uh, Setenga, and people were obliged to come to Dori. That make the population of Dori three or four times its ordinary population. So the massive killing is a simulator of uh, ISIS, and this uh, happened at least uh, three times in this region. So I went there, I talked to stakeholders, I talked to our partners, uh, I talked to the bishop, for example. He said that they have a good relation with uh, the Muslim community, but now they, they try to show a low profile in order uh, not to show to valid extreme groups that the two religion leaders are very close because this can trigger other uh, bad actions. I talked also to our activities participants when they are up invited to an activity that are invited through WhatsApp or other message, but they have to delete those messages when they come to, to the activity. They have to take the bus because if you take a, a, a moped alone, you are going to be killed on the road. So they come together in the, in the common bus, they come at night, but at the latest, at three or four, they have to be back because if you don't do that, then you will be in danger. And even the rhetoric, the language, people try to adapt. For example, the, the terrorists, you never say terrorists. You say people in the bush because you don't know who is who in the community. Okay? And bef because of that, they adapt the, the language. And uh, also, in terms, of, uh, in terms of life, as you know, in this community, nothing, they are, everything is uh, missing almost. So they try to adapt, but they adapt the language. And for a national citizen like, like me, living in the capital city, which is safer, being able to go to this community and live with them three days without any telecommunication link, without uh, with a lot of restriction, it was a good opportunity to have a sense of empathy and know how these people are living. Because this is another issue in Burkina, the big divide between the safe area and also the threat area. Because those under the threat area, they feel that the rest of the community is not concerned about what they are living. But being able to go there and live with them, I think it was a very good opportunity for me to have a good sense of what is going on. And it helped me as a citizen, but also as a partner, to support them and support the civil society organization we are working with. Thank you very much, Yusuf. And maybe just for those colleagues who are not fully aware what GSURF is, is a global fund that is mandated to provide grants to local communities to prevent uh, violent extremism and, and radicalization. So we are working in the countries and whose representatives you are seeing here. And we hear it from Burkina Faso. Let me turn to uh, Maman from Niger, which is one of uh, the recent uh, partner countries. And Maman, you have also been in Tilaberi, which is another region that is not very accessible from, uh, from, from, for, for international and even uh, government members. And you have seen activities on the ground that were aimed at enforcing social cohesion, social dialogue, participate in theater that was aimed at women and children. How are people in Tilaberi are living this reality that they are under constant threat of uh, different groups? Well, uh, thank you both, uh, Giselle and uh, uh, Geneva Santa, uh, Security Center for Policy, for having us here and uh, for the opportunity to talk a bit about what we are seeing in our daily life in Niger. Uh, Recently, I made some uh, field visit in the region of Tilaberi, which is in the uh, western part of Niger. Uh, it's quite big, about uh, the double of Swiss territory or more, uh, about 40 million of inhabitants. Uh, I would see 75% of those uh, population are youth under 20 or to 30 years old. And uh, it's a region when you go, when you get in, you usually see checking points or checkpoints with police in the community where like we have access because certain communities of Tilaberi are not accessible to at all. They are under I would see extremist group control with a kind of sharia where like they can take taxes as it has been mentioned from local population. And uh, you have the lack of social services like education, security of course, health and so on. So it's very, very complicated region one night. And also when we go there, 
We are talking with local authorities, Prefe and uh, Mayos and uh, so on. And uh, most of the subjects that are coming out is about security. Security that makes things complicated for people and uh, for those who are left their places, because you can also see uh, uh, refugees camps and the displaced camps in that region at each corner, I would say. So the fact that insecurity is very, very uh, house present in that region, people, uh, my colleague mentioned the fact that the language is changing. People are not talking about jihadists or so on, but they are talking about those who we don't know who, who they are. Because you can talk, you can be in a group and they talk to someone, you don't know his identity. He is a terrorist or he's someone else. So the situation really affects seriously education, social cohesion. That the, that's why with the, the two program we have with uh, uh, GSELF, we are trying to enhance social cohesion. We're trying to gather authorities, we're trying to gather youth, women group, to talk about how we can get out from that situation. Because there is a local saying, uh, we know in Niger, which we say the one that's inside the roof is the better place to tell you from where rainwater is coming. You know, so that I like that approach, and it's something that really I think it can help to get out from that situation. So, thank it's you. All from me. Thank you very much, and it's clearly very important that at least there are platforms provided and prompting the discussions between the different um, segments of the of the community. Let me turn to my colleague here, Mokhtar who is uh, actually not a national advisor, used to be a national advisor in Mali, but he is now overseeing Mauritania, Burkina Faso, and the Mali uh, program or support of GSERF. So you've grown up in Mali and uh, Ivory Coast. Uh, you know this, this area very well. What do you see Mokhtar as kind of trends coming out on this issue of, of uh, radicalization and recruitment by, by VE groups? Thank you, Dr. Lila. I think it's always a... Uh, Lila. <laughs> well, doctor, <laughs> Dr. Lila. And also, I think it's very important to, as you mentioned, to look a bit of a trajectory to where we've lifted off to where we are today. And I think Dr. Christina, another doctor <laughs> as well, mentioned as well that um, there are about two crises at the moment commitingly manifesting themselves in the Sahel region. But actually, as well, to complement that com aspect is that you have about six conflicts that have been going on in the region since 1960. And the violent extremism, particularly the cases of ISIS, is the least addition to the conflation of issues that have been going on. But what is very interesting about this aspect is that each has their own identity, but each built on the strength and exacerbate the previous one. I think that's very important uh, to get. Um, and with the latest of the case of a violent extremism, particularly with Islamic State in the region, based on our experience as GSERF as well as uh, our on-the-ground work and lead experience with these communities, um, is we, we would like to kind of uh, outline at least four key things that we need to look at in terms of the trend uh, in the region. The first element is that we've moved from what we're known as an internationally inspired to indigenize, heavily indigenized, homegrown violent instruments phenomena. I think that's very, very important to, uh, to understand and to distinct. I think that's why sometimes you may hear people saying, we don't really know what this is, but it's because at the very corner of it, they're built on local ingredient. And I think that's very, very important. The second aspect is what we can see also as the entanglement that we've seen with long-standing socio-political foot lines. Here, if you look at the Sahel re re uh, region, particularly in the Lipta Guguma region, which is Tilaberi, which um, uh, Mahaman visited, Dori Sahel region with Yusufis, and three regions in Mali with the uh, Menaka, Mopti, and the Bajangara uh, re region, you have about 60, about 40 to 60 percent, to let us estimate, where communities have lost a lot of arable land due to growing desertification. And this is a highly agrarian a a a area. And, and I think that that e element has been quite a, a big component of the inflation we see in as well as violent extremist group, particularly the ISIS have been able to kind of integrate himself within the social um, uh, fabric. 
The other element we need to watch out for, which is the third one, is the potential new geographies. In the Sahel region, we used to have con two conflict hotspots. I mean, one is still the hottest, which is the Little Guguma re 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 region. But let's not forget about the Lake Chad Basin uh, re re region. That was the oldest one, uh, actually. Now, the Little Guguma region being at the second and hottest. And now we are seeing, with now the expansion from Mali, going to open a new tri-border area, particularly between Benin, Niger, and Burkina Faso. I think that's a very ele important element, and that's where as well ISIS is very active and is trying to really make sure they can unsettle existing authorities, because for them, ex uh, unsettling existing authority is not just about the local government, but it's about local community structure, really upfilling the, the, the relationship upside down, which has happened with other priorities. The last element, not to be short, is about also the accession, the situation, the development we've seen in Afghanistan and how that reshaped the whole dynamics in the Sahel um, region. I think uh, in the past, Joseph uh, has held um, a, a conference about it to also discuss the implication based on a, uh, on a Korean experience. You might think those are distant, but the Taliban government received accolade and greetings from the Sahel extremist groups. Uh, ISIS formally congratulated them, and that has redesigned how Islamist militancy is linked and and um, and, and, and waged in the region because now there's a new possibility for them to inscribe themselves within the old specter of maybe more peaceful or, uh, uh, approaches. But nonetheless, what is very important to note in here is that the very element of ISIS is again what unite, despite the hidden actors, government, armed groups, and um, Al Qaeda, despite what oppose all of them. All of them are united again, ISIS. And I think that's really tell us the threat and the weight of that threat. Thank you, Lila. Thank you very much, Mokhtar. And I believe that the complexity <laughs> of this is it's, uh, it's something that is extremely challenging. And one way to unify this is really at the community uh, level. And let me turn to, to another colleague of ours from Mali, Abdulie who has been in Gao, the northern part of Mali, and some of the factors that Mokhtar has mentioned are kind of multiplied there, and you could feel it. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience, uh, please? Thank you, Lila. Uh, yes, I recently visited a Gao, uh, even uh, last year, but uh, what I've seen in Gao, I, I had got the chance to discuss with the community members, and uh, uh, let me tell you that uh, the locality that I have visited are the previous uh, uh, community dominated by the Islamist group Mujao, uh, where the crisis started in two, uh, 2012. But the locality are still currently uh, uh, under the influence of violent extremist group because they do some ad hoc attacks. And uh, I have got the chance to discuss with the population what they are living uh, now in Gao, uh, that the violent group are imposing them some taxes to pay some taxes. For example, I discussed with the youth representative uh, in Gao uh, that he told me that I even paid taxes this year, uh, something like uh, 220, uh, 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 250 US dollar. And every year he will pay it, otherwise you will lose your animals, your co or you will be killed. So this is the situation. I've got the chance to discuss with them. That's what they told me. And also violent extremism uh, group are preventing them uh, uh, from cultivating, uh, or whether they will cultivate, they are preventing them to harvesting what they have, they have cultivated. So this is the situation that they are, they are living. And in addition to that, just recently, I think it was last, uh, la 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 last week, there were some violent Asuni group to an IDP camp, which are not far from the, the Gao. And what I've seen when I discussed with them, a kind of resilience from this community, because they were able to set up some platform information where they will share information security threat uh, within themselves, and also uh, communicate with uh, security forces in their locality and the local authorities, and set up some regular patrol. And these are on their own initiative. Uh, so I understood that they really need the minimum thing, but also a, a fragile uh, a communities because they are always uh, exposed to the violent extremist group. But the most important thing is that I've also traveled across the, the river with the canoe. And when I met with the village, the chief of village said that this is the very first time 
in this period, it was in the rainy season, that a donor, a partner uh, took a canoe and visit us. It was really comforting because most of the time they will come in the dry season by bus or by car. But taking a canoe, it was really risky, I have to say, but it was an amazing uh, experience for me as well. And again, for the anecdote, our partner was not believing until we go there because he said, Abdullah, are you sure that you will go with us? We are going back. And I say, Bokum, yes. Are you going right? And you are Malian. If you are going uh, after the river by Kano, let's take the, the risk together. And it was a, an amazing uh, experience for me as well. Thank you, Lila. Thank you so much, Abdullahi. And thank you really for taking the risk. <laughs> but I think it, it comes out that the fact that you are going and they see that there is some hope. They are not forgotten. There, there is the, the, the international community still cares. And there are CSOs that are trying to provide some of the basic services that the government is not in the position to provide. I think this is really important factor for survival and for preventing people to go with this other side that is kind of unknown uh, still. But after all these kind of uh, negative news. Let me turn to my colleague Sarah from Mauritania. Mauritania is kind of a, a gold star country uh, in the Sahel. I'm sorry if I'm politically incorrect. Uh, but the government of Mauritania is really doing something right. There hasn't been a coup. There is limited um, violent extremism. There are hard, we don't really hear many Mauritanians that are joining different groups. What is it that the, 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 the government is doing well in Mauritania and what can we learn from them? Thank you, uh, Lila. Uh, what I can say about uh, the experience uh, that made Mauritania uh, with uh, limited exposure to uh, uh, violent groups is that Mauritania began in 2008 uh, to implement an integral policy to combat these challenges at all levels. Uh, of course, the military level, the reorganization of uh, the military uh, uh, organization, that's the gathering in full uh, bilateral uh, coordination, multilateral coordination, and also um, creating nomadic groups uh, traveling on camels along the borders, etc. But also, uh, what characterizes the Mauritanian approach is that uh, within the, its global vision and strategy, uh, it, they choose to, uh, to um, undertake negotiation with uh, extremists, radicalized uh, detainees following their trials, and have them fill the gap uh, and that separates real Islam from uh, ideological interpretation. And this experience and this negotiation were conducted with ulama, high level uh, uh, educated uh, on Sharia, on Islamic uh, uh, knowledge. And this experience will be duplicated in Mali next December because there is a high level uh, uh, delegation from the Ministry of uh, Islamic Affairs, plus ulama, where, um, who, which is scheduled uh, in next uh, December. Um, I think I will just wanted to share this experience with you, not a negative experience. And thank, thank you, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. And certainly. I think opening up a space for dialogue and bringing on the, the experts, the religious leaders, is certainly one inroad. And it's, it's really encouraging to see that there is this organic sharing already between the Mauritanian uh, government and other governments like the one in um, Mali. Uh, I mean, we, we, we kind of talked about issues in the Sahel, but there is also Nigeria, and let me to, uh, turn to, to my colleague uh, Yatunde here. Nigeria has been equally affected by different strains of violent extremism, first in the Northeast uh, by Boko Haram, but now there is increasing presence of different groups in the Northwest that is also mixed up with banditism and, uh, and organized crime and so on. Yatunde, who are also a national advisor in, in Nigeria, you have extensively traveled in areas where even the Geneva-based um, ambassador had been before, uh, Kano, Kaduna, 
Katsina Sokoto, also with some colleagues uh, from, from uh, GSURF. Uh, how are, what, what kind of trends do you see, especially now with the growing threat in the northwestern part of, uh, of Nigeria? Okay, thank you. Um, so the northwest is, is quite an interesting, and I think um, Mokhtar mentioned, complex uh, situation. Um, the northwest, whilst the northeast uh, was very clearly um, dominated by the Boko Haram and then the later Iswap um, fraction of uh, the Islamic State uh, support to the violent extremism there. It was very clear that it was driven by ideology and there was clear leadership. In the Northwest, um, banditry actually started a number of years ago with um, gold mining and um, I guess politicians um, using thugs and armed thugs to clear communities so that they could um, mine this gold. But then those thugs remained in the bush. There's a large expanse of ungoverned uh, forest area. And so over time, those uh, bandits have uh, went into uh, cattle rustling. Um, so there's, it's the northern part of Nigeria, so there are a lot of uh, Fulani herdsmen that move across the, uh, that region. Um, so when the boys that, because they're, they're generally very young boys that lose their cattle, um, they feel that there's no choice but then to join this group. So over time, that group has grown and grown. Um, but then they started um, then uh, moving into the communities on the border of the forest areas, particularly in Kaduna, where we work. Um, and you just find that um, the farming became very difficult in certain parts of that state um, because they would wait to the harvesting period and then bring um, cows to eat it. But I think the um, dispopula oh, how do you call it? Um, the movement of people away from areas uh, has been systematically growing, particularly in the south of Kaduna, uh, which I think two of our communities are, are very much based there. Um, so when you hear from the people, particularly the women, the women were finding that um, if they went to the farms, uh, when you speak to them, uh, they have a safe, um, the program has safe women's groups. So some of the women were explaining how if they go to the farm, there's a danger of being raped there, a high danger of that. So a lot of farms have been abandoned. Um, the males risk being killed or entering into fights. And a lot of communities have just moved out of those areas. Um, you now, because of this situation, they set up vigilantes. Now, these vigilante groups, because there's um, not sufficient police, have been um, over, in, over enthusiastic, if you like, in uh, pushing back the herdsmen. And so there became this uh, sort of cyclical um, uh, fighting. So one would attack one group, the farmers would attack the herdsmen, the herdsmen would attack the farmers. That has been going on, not just in the northwest, but in the north central for um, a number of years. The government policies, I think at the bottom of this, we have the, the lack of governance is really what has driven this. Government had encouraged um, mass farming without making provisions for the loss of the cattle routes or in, in practice, we should say, because actually the government had made provision for rec a large reclamation of land. Nigeria has lost about 35% 30 of its land mass due to desertification. And so the government actually has a policy to reclaim that land, but has not enforced it. So this is the climate change, um, vigilante, the court system has not been friendly also to the herdsmen, unfortunately. Uh, so there is that battle going on. So that's more the locally grown reasons. But more recently, we, um, Earlier this year, um, the country manager and myself, we, we traveled by train to 
um, well, by plane first, actually, to Kaduna, and then train. Um, two weeks later, both the airport and the train were attacked. And actually, in the train attack, there were, I think, about 160-plus people uh, kidnapped. Um, it was a massive operation, very shocking. Um, and the, the so-called bandits um, actually said that they're not looking for money, that the government knew what they were looking for. And it seems that um, there's a link between the recent um, breakout of about uh, 60 Boko Haram suspects that were held in Abuja. Um, it was a very um, or organized and um, uh, some people would say allowed breakout of those suspects from the prison, along with other prisoners, of course. Um, and, and basically, there is a link between the, um, the release of the kidnapped victims from the train and that breakout. Um, so we, we saw a few weeks after the breakout that the final, I think about 30 to 40 kidnapped victims were finally released after about, um, I think it was a like 170, 80 days. Um, so we're starting to see that the ice swap potentially from the northeast is actually starting to infiltrate into the northwest. And um, one of the, our partners spoke with one of the kidnapped victims who spoke about how they were encouraged to, being encouraged to join uh, their group, being offered housing, job, well, job in a <laughs> another sense, and, and marriage. Uh, so we're, we, we are starting to see potentially a link between what was a homegrown um, violent extremism and, and the more organized um, Islamic State-sponsored um, uh, violent extremism that is going on. So it is a, it is a concern. It is a result, really, of a lack of governance, particularly at local government level, which is why the program has been trying to strengthen the community level governance and linking it with the security forces to build this resilience. Thank you so much, Etunde, and thanks to, to you and Jean-Louis. You have traveled there and, and getting this very important recommendation. And it's kind of really nice to link us to the second part of this discussion, where I, I asked the colleagues to, to think about a few concrete recommendations to the government, but also to the international community. What could we do differently uh, in order to, to, to respond? to these very pertinent needs, because we see displacement, lack of opportunities, huge youth bulge, are all con lack of governance, obviously, all contributing factors to, to why people are joining. So let me ask my uh, colleague Abdulia first, so what could the Mali government and the international community do differently in the context of Mali? Thanks again, Lila, for giving the floor. As some concrete uh, recommendation, maybe two to three I will, hi I will highlight. The first thing what we can do differently is uh, to engage some multi-annual technical capacity building uh, session towards those communities who are affected by the crisis, neither on PVA or governance, uh, and also a long financial support uh, we should bring to this community. This is the first recommendation that I will mention here. The next one will be uh, to work directly with uh, the uh, CSO in the uh, community social civil uh, s society, uh, civil society in uh, this locality. Uh, we should trust them because they know better the context than, uh, than us. And so we should trust them and work directly with uh, this uh, CSO. The next recommendation will be to have a new partnership model focused on local expertise and also peer-to-peer -peer and mentorship and uh, community uh, leadership. Those are some few concrete recommendations that uh, I will highlight uh, for the government and also for the international uh, partners. Thanks, Lila. Thank you very much. I'd be very curious also to hear from Yusuf that is there anything overlapping in your recommendation for the Burkina government or 
and, and to the international community in the case of Burkina Faso? Yes, we have to look at uh, what are the grievances uh, and what um, extremist groups are using actually to recruit. In Burkina Faso, I think for the government there are two things, services and, govern and governance. Because you have some locality where citizens have no link, no service from the government, no water, no sanitation, no health, no education. So there is no link with the government. So the government needs to build this link through services. And the second aspect is governance, because it's related. If the public fund, public finances are poorly managed, then you won't ha have those services. So the government has to work also on uh, governance, uh, good quality government, good planning, in order to offer the services to those local uh, population. And then, as uh, Adler saying, I think um, there are other uh, recruitment factors that international organizations can support local organization in order to build on uh, social cohesion and all these factors. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I start to hear things that are resonating. Maman, how about in Niger? Because Niger has also been doing fairly well uh, in certain areas, uh, but perhaps lastly in other areas. What do you recommend? Thank you. Thank you. I take into account the recommendation made by my colleagues, but beyond that, in Niger we have a particular case that uh, two years ago, the, His Excellency President Bazoum decided to open the door to young people who joined it, extremist group to come back home. It's very hard, but something that is going with yourself. We currently, we're about to have a program on that, on Repanti, to help those young people who joined it, extremist group to come back with of course, uh, income generating activities, which means we need to go beyond social cohesion dialogue and so on to invest in such activities. And also, it's going to be interesting for uh, 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 international organization to work with local actors, youth and the women groups, particularly because I do remember in Nairobi when we went to one of the communities of Telebiri, uh, we were having meeting. We used to have common meeting, I mean, with everybody. And then young people said, okay, we're not going to have meeting together. We prefer to have it separate because we have things to do and we have our own recommendation for you. And it went that way. And I think it's good when, like, we when undertake actions, we need to see what are the specific issues related to each, I mean, local actors, youth and uh, women groups. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maman. And I think what I'm hearing is really working with local civil society organization, having trust them uh, to, to do the work and open up the programs. And I think also what, what you mentioned, uh, Maman, that the policy of the Nigerian government and President Bazoum, who in fact also hosted GSERF uh, a replenishment event in, in New York earlier this year, uh, co-hosted. Uh, he has opened the door for young people to come back and encourage them, and coming back, providing them with services. I think this is very, very key. Sarah, how can the international community help to further and enforce the sharing and the, the uh, experience that Mauritania has here and, and, and globally as well? So for the government, I will say continue your, your effort <laughs> that you keep, you, you keep us safe. And um, helping Mauritania to modernize Islamic school, I think it will be a good idea. Because these traditional schools, frequented by young people, Mauritanian, but also West African, uh, could be a real target for, uh, for help. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah, Tinde, I mean, you have highlighted very deeply uh, some of the issues, and it's truly concerning the intertwining of ISWAP and Boko Haram. What can we do? <laughs> what can the government do besides of obviously having a better governance and more services? Yes, I think, um, I think the current, um, there's, Actually, the international community in, in the Northeast is actually making some strides. I've, I understand from the figures that they're getting a lot 
a large number of repentance, um, Boko Haram uh, uh, youth coming out and they're going through processes of uh, rehabilitation and reintegration. Um, I would say that the efforts that they've made through those large programs is important, but those um, youth need to go back to communities. And it's been handled in the Northeast. Potentially, this should happen earlier, not that it will get to the state of the, the level of the Northeast. Um, so the preventative um, actions in the Northwest should be increased, and particularly the type of work done at community level. And the, the um, PCVE uh, head of the unit in ONSA has actually requested that we find ways to encourage the donors and also private sector to scale up what GSURF is actually doing across the country because its insecurity is actually across the country. It's just not, it's just worse in the Northeast and the Northwest currently. But um, they very much see, they love the GSURF model. They particularly love the fact that we build structures, rebuild structures because of the, um, the absence of local government um, autonomy. So I think it's to basically for the international community to look into funding and encouraging their own private sector organizations as well, their, their, um, their trade programs and their, um, uh, uh, what do you call them, departments of commerce to also get involved in this type of thing. Let me, let me uh, ask you just a follow-up question on that. GSTF has started some public-private partnership in Nigeria. Can you just tell us a few words? What are the advantages of this uh, work that is being done there? Okay, yes. So um, many organizations already have their um, corporate respons um, social responsibility um, departments, but they're unable to really reach those communities that are difficult to access and that really actually need the support. So um, what GSURF was able to do with um, IHS, which is a company that builds communication towers across the country, uh, was to partner with them and do the mobilization through our partners um, in the communities that we work in. And we were able to mobilize those youth from those very vulnerable um, communities to actually access um, basic ICT training. And then IHS also provides um, communication kiosks. So near the masts that they have, because we have uh, fluctuating electricity in Nigeria, they will establish a, a kiosk with computers on. So the training doesn't just end after the five-day training. They can then go and use these um, uh, computers at the kiosks and actually um, one, it, it's, it provides employment for those that man the kiosks, but we've encouraged them to look into online uh, digital jobs, um, IT jobs, because now you can actually work for IT companies across uh, the world. And so we, we actually encouraged the youth to say, whatever type of employment you do, you will need these basic skills anyway. But there's an op actually an opportunity also to key into the digital space that is out there. Thank you very much. And the digital space, I think it's very important and in terms of the recommendations as well that we stop training 200 carpenters in one village and 150 mechanics or tailors. So I think digital space is definitely an area where, where there's a lot of demands, a lot of needs and not enough um, workers. So hopefully this, this partnership can be multiplied or amplified in the context of, of Nigeria and, and elsewhere. And lastly, let me turn to, to Mokhtar, really look at from the, the, the Sahel from the overall perspective. I mean, it is a hotspot. We know it is a hotspot. There are efforts going on. What can we do differently? Because it's, it, communities are get, some communities are getting better, but the overall picture is still very grim. Thank you. Lila? <laughs> 
first two points. When Dr. Christina mentioned the slide or showed the slide, I don't know if a lot of you have seen at the bottom there were about $4.3 billion or something. There was some monetary figures to show how much the crisis cost. But what is important in that background to notice is that for the past, this is something that's been going on for the past, uh, for recent memory on violent extremism for the past decades. And about billions of dollars has been invested, but it keeps getting worse. So we should ask ourselves, why and where are we getting it wrong? And that brings me to, to the first point about we need a systemic shift from symptomatic responses to systemic responses. And I think both government, donors, collectively, it's a collective responsibility that we need to take that, um, that approach. And that's why Jesus says it brilliantly in terms of that community bear the, bear the brunt of violent extremism, and they're also best place to act on this action. I mean, I, that was, when I saw that, I was like, all right, I'm gonna join this organization. So um, that really means bring the revising, at least bringing back the communityness in community-based approaches, and the integratedness in integrated uh, approaches. But so far, that's not what a lot of intervention do. It's good on paper, but in practice, that's not really what we see. The second and last point, is about, we talk about the conflict. Again, referring to Dr. Christina's slides. Thank you, Dr. Christina, by the way. You've made my life a lot easier uh, with those slides. Uh, we saw the conflict, the numbers increasing. Um, but what is important to understand across this geography in the Sahel region, you have about 60 to 70% of the population who is highly rural. That means automatically 60 and 70% of the conflict in the region, in the continent, are rural. But yet, more than 80 to 90% of decision making on how to solve this are urban based. That is the imbalance that needs to be fixed. Thank you, Lila. Thank you very much, uh, Mokhtar. And let me thank uh, the panelists uh, now and also my colleagues. A lot of colleagues here are sitting from GSERF. So, all big, big shout out to you for, for all the teams within uh, GSERF. So, let's shift to the third part of this. Um, uh, panel discussion, and I am obliged to read to you the GDPR disclaimer uh, of the Q&A session, so which we will start now. So please note, as this is a public discussion, the Q&A might be subject to recording, transfer, and posting on social media. And if you do not wish for your name or position to appear, you may refrain from introducing yourself when asking your question. So. Over to you now, and also I'm, I'm monitoring my phone for online uh, for the online colleagues uh, for questions. So please, there are the experts here. Ask them, sir. Hi. Uh, my name is Mark Knight. I'm the central director of GCFP. Um, everyone mentioned. Uh, oh, thank you. Hi. Uh, so all the all the speakers. Thanks very much, by the way. Uh, mentioned governance. Um, and what's the other, you associate it, governance as a, as a driving factor here. I wonder if, if you have time, if each of you could comment on the areas that these groups take over, what is the governance situation then? How, how does it change? Does it, do they do something specific? Is there a governance aspect to these groups? And how, how is it different to what came before? Thanks. Excellent question. Maybe let's let's try to answer that, and then we can go for other questions. Yusuf, would you mind starting? Yes. I, I say if those uh, areas are taken by a violent extremist group, it means that government is just uh, poorer than ever because the government is no longer there, municipalities are no longer there because uh, elected council are actually target or violent extremist group. So it's a vacuum uh, now. In, in those areas because the government is not present, local government are not present. And just to give you an example, in this area, there's a municipality that's called um, uh, Gorom, very close to, to, to Dori. You have, um, uh, they have a big budget, uh, thanks to the support of uh, mining uh, companies. But when you take the, the, the budget line for, for fuel, then it's almost uh, five or ten percent of the, the budget. Uh, that's for prestige and uh, maybe for, for 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 the leaders. That's that's not go to to to, to the citizen. 
This same money, in two years or three years, it can solve totally the problem of water. While in this region, people have to ride long distances in order to get water. But the solution is there. But the way resources are allocated, I think that's the problem. And that's why those simple solutions, which are water, uh, health centers, which will show the link between a citizen and his or her government, those links are not there because the resources are used in order to improve the status of the leaders than really targeting uh, the, the problem of citi citizen. Yeah. Thank you. Yetunde, how, how is it in Nigeria? Yeah, um, I think the, so I've been corrected before, so when I've said that we're building community um, structures, um, that people say, no, you're reinstating those structures. Those structures used to exist in the past, but then at some point government said that we're, we're having a three-tier set of government and power will be devolved to the local government. That didn't happen. And so those um, um, local structures, the community structures of the community leader, the traditional leader, um, so, for instance, the herdsmen and the traditional leader used to discuss between themselves before. But local government took over that role some years ago. But with the changes of government, this left uh, basically a gap. So um, what you, f you found over time is that because of that erosion of the community level, which, which some people call the fourth level of governance, um, over time, um, people have forgotten and forgo don't realize that they can reinstate that. We've seen that when you do reinstate it, they not only prevent um, violent extremism and, and clashes, they solve it before it ex escalates, and they also um, go into development um, agencies as well. So I went to a community in Kogi State, and they actually had um, repaired their... Uh, water system, uh, because we combine it also with vocational things that we, we develop cooperatives, the women start being productive, they establish themselves and even apply for different loans as well. So they managed to get a vehicle from a World Bank loan because they were organized. So it's um, when you start with preventing violent extremism, you're also establishing a base for further development as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe just from a perspective of Mali, so how is the governance of these V groups that are taking over is different from from the other type of governance? <laughs> uh, Lila, I won't say it's totally different. It's quite similar from uh, Burkina Faso. For example, in Gaud, again, in the locality that I visited, there's a lack of good governance because, as I did mention in my previous intervention, uh, the communities really need the minimum uh, support because they told me that they never receive a visit from the local, I mean, for the central government. So this is one factor. Another factor is that it's not totally that the governance is wrong in this locality because, but, but the violent extremist groups have imposed in, in, in the law in this community. So sometimes they don't have choice. Maybe the governance was not very good, but the violent extremism uh, has taken over the locality and the community don't have choice. But broadly speaking, uh, have to we have to recognize that uh, the governance is not at the top as uh, we expected. So this is the situation here uh, in the locality. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, sorry, maybe one important thing here yeah, is uh, because I've been working on the field in the past many years uh, in Mopti, in Gao, in Tomutu, and I hear a lot from the community members uh, the problem of justice, and this is the reality. There is injustice in this locality, and if maybe uh, another recommendation that I will make probably is to work uh, uh, very well on the uh, justice uh, landscape in the future. And this is the reality in the uh, community at the real level. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abdullahi. Uh, I, I would like to read a question out and I will ask my colleague Mokhtar to, to uh, answer that and of course anyone else from the panel. 
So the question is, how can we help as human rights activists and militants in the field of health and education? This question comes from a representative of an NGO of the UN offices in Geneva and Vienna. I don't know why they get the tough one to, to me. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, from the perspective of human rights or education, I think there are, there's a crucial deficit of those infrastructures, both in terms of the, um, the actual approach and delivery on every echelon of the scale, there's a crucial deficit. And I think uh, uh, the first direct answer to that would be there's a crucial need for, for, for that and it's more advancement. But I think where we are, I sense the question, Lila, is more of the, the importance of the how. And I think that's what we're trying to really get into in here. First, in all of these communities, we really need to question our interpretation of their realities. And I think that's a very key and fundamental uh, uh, aspect. So when uh, my, my kind of a suggestion, or uh, at least from our experience as GSERF and what we've seen that works in those areas, will be particularly to really always go to this com com community, move it from a particular donor intervention to more of a partnership model a, a, a approach. We've seen that working quite well with some of our intervention. We now, with former extremist group, we have a program. We're now the one helping rebuild the education and health infrastructure they have helped destroy it while they were active on, on, on the other side. And doing that has a partnership has a lot more benefit to this community because it really shifts the narrative, it really shifts the, um, uh, the, even the impact and the ownership as well of that. Uh, particular aspect. But lastly, and most importantly, is as well that to link those aspects to the institutional approach to those responses. Because let's be a bit, you know, I think we, we all know, know, know this, but I'm going to state it, is that the formal and official government, regardless of our uh, their shortcomings, remain the only and legitimate interlocutor. In this, in, in, in this area. Whatever is done without them in concrete or without them some supporting, without them being able to integrate with the institutional state up, apparatus, is bound to be limited and it's ultimately bound to be failed. I think we all know how government can also perfectly in, intervene with those areas when they do not agree. Over, Lila. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else from the panel who wish to respond yeah, to yeah, this just question? Uh, yes, one sir. Point. I think uh, in Burkina, the, the health sector will be a very important. Uh, kind of uh, social right that uh, international organization can provide. Because in Burkina, when violent extremist group get to a point, they will burn down schools, everything, every symbol of government, but they, they, they don't touch the health centers. Mm. Yeah, they leave the health center. And even the, the, the personal of the uh, health centers, uh, they, they are safe because they need this service. And this service also, also is a, it's a good sign for, for, for the citizen that the government is present. So given the situation now, I think we can start with really the health service uh, to guarantee those uh, social rights, and that could be a good uh, starting point. And uh, we have um, very strong uh, international organizations in Burkina uh, uh, which can be helped. We, uh, we don't need to go through the government, but uh, there are local NGOs which are very strong because the health centers, at least 30% of the health centers are implemented, uh, procured by, the, by NGOs and uh, civil society organizations. Yeah. Please, Mbaman. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've spoken uh, previously about uh, I mean, internal uh, policies and uh, related to education. Uh, there is an idea that is called in Niger about uh, creating centers for particularly women, uh, those who come from uh, I mean, uh, coming in, in, in conflict, those are who are replaced. So. Uh, the idea is like to create in certain places that are safe those uh, uh, schools in order to educate them and uh, of course like coaching without education nothing will work. So I think it's good from international uh, organization to help that idea from uh, Nigerian government. Thank you and it's a, it's a priority for the government of, of uh, President Bazoum. Question please.
Stevens, uh, the former ambassador of Sierra Leone here in Geneva, and currently a fellow at the, at the GCSP. Now, um, thank you very much for this presentation. I really wanted to sit down and witness. I didn't even want to have it virtually, because I know that when you look at the ISIS and these organizations, people in people's minds, they have gotten rid of ISIS. But the fact is that ISIS is with us in Africa. And we are the ones bearing the con. ISIS has not gone away. And this is why I think your, what, you are, what we are doing here today is extremely important. And it should go even beyond GCSP. We should try to find a way of taking it beyond. But I think one of the things that I love is that what we are saying now is because I think the general approach is the military solution. And I think the message you are putting clearly here is that it is not a, just a military solution. It might be necessary, because in my country where we had the Civil War, you know, you found that, I mean, the saying that a hungry man is an angry man, you see that that is, was very important. I mean, young people were joining the rebels for a sacrifice. You know, they had no ideological conviction. So I think it's interesting that um, 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 these things should be brought out. But the question I have really is relating to your government in terms of, because I, we hear the, from the human rights perspective, you know that the UN and international community will work in silos. At one point, we are talking about human rights. Another time, we are talking about peace and security. And another time, we are talking about development. Because if we are sitting now, in this same in a forum where we are talking about the sustainable development goals, you know, we would be talking. I mean, if the, the respective governments would be would be telling us how well they were doing, they would not bring out this problem, even though they said no one should be left behind. So, my question to you is, what do you think the government should be doing more to say, look here in our countries we have this problem? And people are bound to be left behind. Let's not forget them. Let them address. Let us address them too. Thank you very much, and it's it's an honor to have you, Ambassador, in the audience, colleagues, yeah. <laughs> and also feel free, Abdullah and Sarah. Yes. You, you know, it's, it it all depends on how you do planning and how you do allocation. Most of those planning and allocation are political basis. The more you are powerful, the more you are mighty in the system, the more you attract investment and solution to your locality. And those localities which don't have leaders, then they are left behind. So I think the government can create a mechanism where all the country, all the citizens, so the way of allocating resources is well uh, defined so that we don't have a, a geographic uh, differences. I think that's, uh, th that will be a solution. So uh, there are tools for that. You can use the inform uh, geographic information uh, system to see, for example, how you allocate the uh, water point, how you allocate the health centers, and what are the vacuum, what are the, the, the places where you have people with less services. So those are rational tools of planning. And I think this can help reduce inequalities, geographic and social inequalities. Yeah. Abdullah. Maybe I can stay here? Yes. Oh. Maybe, you, okay. maybe you can stand yeah. there because then colleagues online can also yeah. Yeah. hear you. Ah, but it's missing the microphone. Okay, <laughs> okay. thank you uh, for this question. I think one of the uh, important things is also to work on the decentralization uh, aspect. We have started the decentralization, but it's not working very well, let's say, because if we discuss with some of the community members, they have a very good development local plan, but the results may not be fairly uh, shared within, uh, inside the country, but also they have the good plan and they are not uh, having uh, financial support as they wishes or the financial support will not come as a, 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 a the, the plan. For example, a, a good example, in Gao, again, because I've been there twice, and <laughs> I love uh, this uh, locality. <laughs> we can tell, <laughs> you love Gao. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, when I discuss uh, with the communities, you know, the local development plan, uh, they have integrated some violent extremism, a very good violent extremism plan. But the time the fund will arrive, uh, maybe the dynamic change very quickly. 
So if, uh, for example, the, 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 the resources should be allocated, uh, it's annually allocated. But for this year, uh, found might come later, very later. So and the dynamic change very quickly. So the government, the, local, the central government should be, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, working on this one to fluently, I mean, uh, to give, to share uh, uh, the fund uh, as uh, quick as possible. So to be uh, concrete is uh, we should work on the decentralization uh, aspect. Uh, this is very important in the uh, current context. Ooh, okay, I have questions coming in online <laughs> as well, but maybe yeah, Tunde, okay. briefly, because there's Very just briefly. two more. Just to add to that, I think the decentralization, Nigeria, we're working on the um, local government autonomy, so it takes it closer to the people, uh, but also community agency. Community needs to get involved in the budgeting process, the planning process. So that plan you were talking about should be put into the annual budget. They should then talk to their House of Assembly. Um, basically holding your um, government's elected or civil servants um, accountable and then following that plan and, and following the budget to make sure that it's delivered so that next time they come around for elections they'll have something to uh, <laughs> defend. Credibly defend. Mm. Yes. Well, thank you. Uh, well, I, I don't want to tease my, my friend uh, Lai, but in Niger, decentralization is a kind of reality. And uh, unfortunately, when you go to talk with local mayors and uh, so on, they have plans, they know what they need. But only that the central government doesn't allow them enough means to really implement those politics. So I think we need to go to, to work on that side to seriously trust in those uh, local government in order to allow them to seriously work on the plan that they have. And uh, as I said, they are really close to local population and they know what's going on in terms of security, in terms of development and so on. So that's my course. Thank you very much, Roman. And there are two questions online and I think one can be very quickly answered and then the last one will be kind of the closing from the panel before I hand it back over uh, to Christina. So the first question is, can you estimate whether the caliphate will expand further to the Gulf of Guinea, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire and how would this impact the Sahel region overall? And I think the, the clear answer is it is already happening. It's not really in the, me in, the, in the international media, but we have been talking from colleagues from Ghana, from Benin, from Cameroon, from Togo, who are saying that, for instance, in Ghana, the, the whole northern part is at fear. The government has very recently announced that this is a real threat, uh, uh, that the violent extremists can run over the, the country. And it's not only, it's not just because they are coming from the Sahel, but it's they are the homegrown driver, similarly, of the Sahelian countries, the, the limited government authorities, lack of services, etc., that are not being taken care of. So if we want to look at from a prevention perspective, it's extremely important that we start working on prevention now, and that we are probably already a bit too late. So um, I think this is also a recommendation that, that uh, GSERF can put out there that let's start working on prevention in, in the coastal states. Uh, and the last, uh, the last question, how would you describe state society and civic military relations in, in your countries, um, especially as Mali and Burkina have been frequently um, experienced the, the coups? Um, what can the international community do about this? That's, uh, the relation between uh, civil society and, uh, uh, and... And civic military relations. Uh, yes, Burkina Faso <laughs> has uh, experienced uh, two coup d'etat in uh, 2022. Uh, tw yes, uh, and uh, in, in those uh, regions like Dori, it's a big divide between the military and civilian because of uh, the violation of human rights arbitrary action. And this has become a big issue in Burkina today. So the relation between the civilian and the military in uh, Dori and the Sahel is very difficult and it has become a, a vulnerable factor. 
on which we have to work, and there are some civil society organizations uh, defending human rights, uh, uh, pointing out those uh, violations, but also training the security forces on those aspects. Uh, because in Burkina Faso, we are going to recruit 50,000 volunteers for the defense of the nation. Those are, they are not military, they are community members that will be trained and be given guns. So there are risks that some people use those power in order to solve a previous problem. So I think there's a need to continue training and uh, sensitizing these actors, all those who have some power in terms of gun and all this, in order to observe those human rights. And I think that will uh, improve the relationship between civilian and the military. And that uh, can also help improve the, the, the fight against ISIS. Thank you very much. The last word for Abdullahi from a Malian perspective. Uh, from Malian perspective, uh, I've been visiting many localities since last year. And uh, at the early this year, I've visited Nara, the border with Mauritania, and I discussed with the communities, and uh, they were happy. I think uh, they had good relationship with the military because one of their aspiration is was security and currently with the military operation across the country uh, they are able to chase away some extreme, some extremist group and this was something that uh, the community appreciated a lot it's not only in nara but also uh, in segu and uh, in mopti wherever i visited and i discussed with them to understand their perspective uh, on the uh, military operation they were satisfied with the uh, military operation at, and let's say for the moment being, uh, there, there is a good collaboration ship between uh, them, and uh, but we don't know how the situation uh, will change because one aspiration is security, but it's not enough. So there is development. Uh, my colleagues mentioned it: health, uh, uh, social uh, uh, based needs, health, education, and sanitation. Uh, but the main aspiration of the community in those locality uh, was uh, security, and government is trying to recover uh, those locality where violent extremism group had uh, taken over. Thank Th you. Thank you very much. So let me take this opportunity really to, to thank this extremely uh, knowledgeable and experienced panel uh, who uh, had the honor to chat. I really want to thank. Uh, my colleagues at GSERF, colleagues at GCSP, and acknowledge our executive director who has just came up from the plane from Mozambique, Khalid. <laughs> uh, maybe we can give a, a, a round of applause for dear panelists. <laughs> Christina, thank you. Thank you so much. I just wanted to quickly uh, thank again everyone here who has come physically to the GCSP for this uh, seventh Geneva security debate. I'm really happy to see so many of you. I also want to thank everyone who has been with us online uh, until the end. Uh, thank you for being uh, listening to our wonderful panel. Uh, most of all, I wanted to thank uh, GSERF uh, for your collaboration. I hope this is one of many uh, future events at the GCSP and perhaps we can collaborate on other uh, uh, things. I, I thought perhaps what one thing that we could do is we could create a statement uh, from this event that we could then bring to the, the African Leaders Summit that will be happening in the US uh, mid-December uh, to take all these wonderful ideas that you have uh, given us and share it in an actual uh, policy um, paper perhaps or, or some other medium uh, to, to, to feed into uh, that event in mid-December. Um, I also wanted to just highlight one final thing. Um, I want to thank all the people here who have made this event happen, Christian, um, uh, Juliet, and, and especially Tobias Nape for uh, your incredible collaboration and cooperation in creating this event. So thank you so much. Um, and one last point before I like to uh, uh, thank the audience and, and our speakers. Um, I wanted to highlight that we're gonna have another Geneva security debate 
uh, on the 19th of December. And why I'm highlighting it is that we are going to focus exactly on the issues that we have highlighted and started to talk about here, um, about how we need a systemic shift on our approaches and fighting um, terrorism in Africa, because the counterterrorism approach we have tried this far has really failed uh, spectacularly. So we really need to find a new, new ideas, new solutions, and preventing violent <laughs> extremism from a whole of government and most importantly, whole of society approach, because human security has come out as the most important indicator of, of helping societies build resilience against extremists, food, water, health, education, and justice. The, so on that note, thank you so much, and I wish you all a wonderful afternoon, but let's give our panelists one last round of applause. Thank you. So see you on December 19th.